welcome you to worship today. We remember the words from Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Would you join us in singing together, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Let us pray. From your throne and presence, O God, we are given life beyond our ability to imagine. Holy, holy, holy one, we praise you that you have made us and redeemed us, claimed us and brought healing among us. Yet we wander still again from your ways and your love. Hear us now as we come before you in a time of confession through silence. Amen. We carry burdens, O giver of mercy, burdens of guilt, estrangement, inadequacy, and more. Forgive us wherein we have failed you, failed ourselves, and failed others. Lift us again in love, so that day by day we faithfully serve you among all of your people in the way and spirit of Jesus Christ. Friends, let us hear and share with gladness the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Oh, wow. 
May we hear the word of God from Romans chapter 11, verses 32 through 36. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him to receive a gift in return? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. During the years of his faith-sharing ministry, his faith community organizing, and his teaching the gospel of God through Jesus Christ, from the years of about 45 to 65 in the same century dated from Jesus' birth, the Apostle Paul spent time writing letters of encouragement and theology to the Christians around the Mediterranean. And there are some who say that the letter to the church at Rome is the last of his correspondences included in the canon. It is true that it is the first to appear in the list of several in a row, but it is arguably the most highly developed in Paul's clearest style. The five verses that George has helped us to read and hear this morning may be considered the peak or the summit of this letter. The preceding 11 chapters to this point um, bring us to these verses. And the following five chapters, one might say, descend from these verses. Now, many have also said that the core conviction of the letter to the Romans is found in chapter 8, verse 39. You may know that verse. Nothing in all creation, in heaven or on earth, can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and yet it is through the next three chapters, beyond chapter 8, and, and it's statement of core conviction. In the next three chapters, Paul continues upward, we might say, to answer a question such as, who is us? When he says, nothing can separate us, in chapter 8, verse 39, who is us? Would that be other Christians? And if Christians, what about Jews? Because God's covenant, Paul has argued, was with the Jews. What about the Jews? Because Jesus himself was a Jew. It's as if Paul senses that the word us in chapter 8 verse 39 needs increased explanation. Who is us? that God will not separate from the type of love embodied and lived in Jesus. The us in the core conviction verse of Romans 8, 39, according to Paul, likely is all of God's people. Since here at the end of chapter 11, when Paul has argued through chapters 9, 10, and 11, about God's covenant promises which began in Genesis and which have continued forward to his present day. And he anticipates going beyond his present day, those promises. He then concludes, all people stray from God's will for shared faithfulness. Now that echoes Romans 3.23, all sin and fall short of God's glory. All. So who is included in the eternal promise? Are any excluded? Paul doesn't answer yes and he doesn't answer no. 
but he moves to a rhetorical question. Who has known the mind of the Lord? And the answer to this crescendoed rhetorical question, it's not stated, but we know the answer. It's no one. No one has known the mind of the Lord. No one has been God's specialty consultant. And then Paul pens a doxology, a statement of thanks and praise for from God and through God and to God are all things. To God be glory forever. Amen. That's the end of this symphonic movement. It is the end of chapter 11. And then at chapter 12, verse 1, Paul begins his descent from the summit of Romans, saying essentially, so here is now the way God calls us to live and serve with one another, all of God's people together. Paul's reaching the summit of his letter to the Romans with a conclusion that all people are sinners before God, that no one has been God's counselor, and that all praise is due to God, indicate that God has a high bar for God's self and a much lower bar for us as God's people, or, or something like that. Be bear with me. Now, our low bar for life as Jesus' disciples, it's never easy. Paul is the first to argue how it is never easy. And, and, and this low bar life for Jesus' disciples, while it's never easy, it's always more than we can hold in our hands. It fills up and runs over with difficulty. Yet, we do not have to worry about being God. God can take care of the extremely high bar involvement that it takes to be God. God's wisdom, compassion, equity, respect, faith, hope, love, all of that is alive with God and as God becomes involved with us at our own low bar level with our hands full of struggle. Jesus taught, did he not, that you and I can and should pray every week. O oh God, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus taught that, that God's high bar of eternal wisdom moves to God's engagement with people in the earthly theater. And that includes you and me and all others past and present. The truth is that we need not attempt to do God's eternal wisdom and love and justice work at the high bar that is God's. Because we do have, as we've said, our hands full following Jesus right here, right now, where God's will and ways are still unfolding in ways we expect and quite often in ways that truly surprise us. Let me give you an example of how God surprises us when we may think we can anticipate what's going to happen. A few weeks ago, I had a reason to follow through on an administrative assignment at the church on when the First Presbyterian Children's Center started. So I went to the office where the fireproof cabinet is, and I, I removed from that cabinet the minutes of 1960 to 1969. I thought that ought to cover what I'm looking for. And I'll tell you, I didn't find what I needed. But I did find this. It's the minutes from a called meeting on Sunday afternoon, 
April the 7th, 1968. Uh, the, I suspect the main and initial reason for the meeting being called was the agenda item to examine confirmation candidates uh, as they were going to be received in the next week or so uh, in worship. But there was a second item on the agenda. And so McNeil Drumright, who was the clerk of session, writes this. Next, Ernest Smearden, chairman of the service committee, advised the session that a request had been received from a Negro girl for use of our church for her wedding. Well, I almost stopped and folded the book up right then, saying to myself, I think I know how this is going to end and I don't want to read it. But the minutes continue. It was explained that her own church at Welburn was in poor repair and inadequate for the wedding, that she is a student enrolled in Texas A&M University, and that her fiancé is from a family with some Presbyterian affiliation, though he is not presently active in his church. Smearden moved that the sanctuary of the church be made available to Rosetta Denise Wilburn and her fiancé for their wedding starting at 7.30 p.m. May 4th, 1968, and that the parlor of the church be made available to a limited number for a reception after the wedding ceremony. Motion seconded by Clark Monroe and carried. But that's not all. The next paragraph reads this way. Elder Smearden then introduced the following motion, that the sanctuary and other facilities of the First Presbyterian Church are available for Christian weddings to our members and to all others who do not have a church home. When people have their own places of worship, it is suggested that those places be used. However, if for some good reason a building different from their own church plant is required, the First Presbyterian Church may be used. Motion was seconded by Quinn Vance and carried. Friends, when you're reading along on a set of session minutes like that, dated April the 7th, 1968, four o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday, and you realize that less than 72 hours before, in Memphis, Tennessee, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and the cities of the nation were in many places on fire. Here you have a session of this church meeting 13 men elders, 13 white men elders, a pastor and an associate pastor. They meet with their first agenda item being to, to examine the confirmation class, but they have one other item. And then if you're reading along and you say to yourself, oh my goodness, I think I know how that will turn out and it won't be good. But instead, you read that openness and generosity and respect bloom and blossom like a time sequence photo of a flower that goes from bud to blossom. When that happens, it shows that a given group of people were working at their low bar callings in Bryan, Texas, and God's high bar wisdom in the spirit of Jesus Christ was working right there among them. I can't guarantee you very much but I can guarantee you that Presbyterian elders, like the clerk of session, do not make up session minutes like that. Four months later in that same year, in Gatesville, uh, two hours northwest of Bryan, I started my sophomore year at Gatesville High School. At the time, my dad was 45 years old. Mrs. Frances Bradley was around 60 years old. The two of them had been co-teaching an adult Sunday school class at the First Presbyterian Church since 1950. That would be 18 years. And in August of 1968, their 
first Presbyterian Gatesville uh, class began studying uh, Christian doctrine by Dr. Shirley C. Guthrie, Jr., uh, a Presbyterian uh, who was actually a graduate of Kilgore High School uh, in East Texas. This particular copy is uh, tattered because uh, 52 years later, uh, it, it is the copy that my dad used in that class teaching with Ms. Bradley. I, I pulled it off the shelf a few weeks ago and the last page of the text is a page where he has underlined three sentences. No one knows exactly what lies ahead for Christian theology. Secondly, we must hope not so much for sure conclusions as for faithful and intelligent searching. Three, the church must always be reforming because no person or group of people in any period can master the truth of God. I don't read those sentences from Dr. Guthrie this morning because you should swallow what he wrote in 1968 or that you should swallow certain underlined sentences because people like Mrs. Bradley and my dad taught from Dr. Guthrie's text and underlined such sentences. I read those sentences to you this morning because it reflects what the Apostle Paul wrote 1900 years before 1968. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been the Lord's specialty counsel? No one has. It's above our pay grade. Yet to God, who is revealed in Jesus Christ, be all glory. Let us never bet against what God's high bar, wisdom, compassion, respect, equity, faith, hope, and love can accomplish among any or all of God's people, even yet in this day and beyond. That would be with you and with me and with all others. All honor and praise be to God.
begin our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession this morning with each of us praying in silence for ourselves and for others. How we thank you, O Blessed One, that you make us in your image for healthy community with others, that no one is created for being an island to oneself alone. We thank you for love, respect, compassion, and tenacious faithfulness. On this day designated for recognizing and honoring fathers, receive our gratitude where men have modeled and shared sacrifice, service, courage, and joy. Place again your grace within us and within our relationships. Bring your health and wholeness to your children everywhere of all ages. Grant rest for those who are weary, strength for those who are debilitated, patience for the anxious, comfort for the bereaved, guidance and helpful confidence for the discouraged. Grant welcome for the excluded as we remember with profound appreciation those who have lived and died before us, we join our voices with theirs from eternity, praying as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. To join us and sing hymn 301, let us build a house. Friends, 
Go out into the world today and listen for God's presence in your life. Praise him in all that you do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.